Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I've been invited to talk to you guys about some of the new IFRS standards coming our way. Um, so I'm going to hit those at a pretty high level, narrow in on a couple of the uh, finer points of it, uh, as well just some of the narrow scope uh, items that have come out under some different IFRSs, not too big an impact. And uh, a lot of this is what I'm going to call a what the heck series. We've got new stuff out here, and I often go and I see new stuff, what the heck. So you're probably going to hear that from me a little bit. I'm also going to, uh, as part of this, share with you some of uh, last night's events. Uh, I have the luxury of having uh, last night 1,200 kids, 1,200, coming past my door in various stages of dress. Um, and handing out candy and so I've got a little time breakdown as it as it goes through the night where we start and then where we finish and uh, and the crowds hordes if you will coming through ton of fun ton of fun um, so going through the IFRS standards the new stuff coming at you there's basically three they will have an impact on you for probably two of these standards the standards the third one maybe not so much IFRS 9 is financial instruments. I expect this is going to hit everybody. IFRS 15 will hit everybody with revenue. Uh, and IFRS 16, which is leases, while not affecting you January 1 of 2018, is going to hit most companies in 2019. Um, and that one is really brought to you by uh, the airline industry. Um, so to start with, this is not my place. This is across the street, um, just as a warm-up. This would have been about, mm, I'm going to guess, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, my neighbors actually do go out with their shovels, and they actually do dig up their own lawns. <laughs> so let's start with IFRS 9. This is effective Janu January 1, 2018. Gee, that's not very far away. It uses a business model test for assets, uh, classifications based on how they're managed, and that is basically are you going to hold it or are you going to sell it. It affects a ton of things, long-term loans, equity investments, what we call non-vanilla financial assets and hedging. And the primary focus here is on assets. So we used to have four classifications for our financial assets. That's now really two. Uh, and those two are amortized cost and fair value. You'll notice 2.5, and I kind of have three here, so I'm half lying to you from the get-go. So amortized cost and fair value, but amortized cost has a little twist to it because within amortized cost, you get to make a choice. That choice is based on what kind of contract you have as a receivable. And that is, is it principal and interest, or is there an intention to hold the asset as well, or make a gain from it, make a sale on it? So the first step in looking through your IFRS is what kind of asset do you have? What kind of financial instrument asset do you have? Is it a receivable? If it's a receivable, you're going to ask yourself, if it, is it vanilla or not? So it's, you're going to ask, is it a receivable or is it equity? What are you holding? Someone else's debt or are you holding someone else's shares? And I'm going to focus on receivables for a minute because they've got a what the heck item in here in the handbook. And that what the heck item is called solely, principal, uh, solely payments of principal and interest, SPPI. And uh, I've replaced that terminology with something called vanilla. It's just principal and interest. So if you have a vanilla receivable, standard principal and interest stuff, it's going to be subjected to a business model test. And that model test is class, if you're going to hold this thing just as standard receivable, you're going to classify this as amortized cost, and you're going to use the effective interest method. That's something we've used for years. Um, and if the business model is to sell, then you're going to classify it as fair value through other comprehensive income. 
And for any other kind of receivable, so you've got standard receivables, non-standard, and, non and a non-standard, an example might be um, a convertible loan receivable. That's non-standard. Well, that kind of goes right through fair value through profit or loss. It's not going to be amortized cost. We used to what we call bifurcate that, another what, what the heck term. Bifurcate is kind of separate, separated into equity and, and um, um, <clears throat> sorry, receivable components. And now it's just one instrument, goes through fair value, through profit or loss. And if your asset is equity, that is to say shares in a private or a public company, usually less than 20%, um, you get to make an, el an election right at the get-go. It's going to be measured at fair value, but you have to make an election whether you're going to have the increase or decrease changes in values go through either of the P&L or your second election, which is to push it through other comprehensive income, and that's an item on the balance sheet. Once you make that decision, it stays there forever. It's not going to move. Um, and I would make that, you know, when you decide, when, you're, when you've got an investment in shares, you have to make that upfront decision. I would document somewhere what your decision is upfront. I would have that in the minutes, director's minutes or something out there so that you have something to fall back on that says that's what we decided day one because you're not supposed to use the benefit of hindsight to make this decision. As the night progresses, <coughs> This would, be, uh, this would be brought to you by yours truly. Uh, and this created actually more excitement for the little kids than did the ghoulish outfit that I was wearing. Uh, and a lot of mothers and dads had to explain that that isn't real. <laughs> Measurement considerations, equity investments, hey, and this matters. They're measured at fair value. Equity investments are measured at fair value. <clears throat> Under the old method, we had an ability to measure it as a fallout position, cost. They've really tried to take that away. So private companies now, your investment should be measured at fair value. And that will create some hiccups for companies. So be, be forewarned. As for non equity financial items, that would be your receivables again. They're also they're subject to new rules. There's an impairment test you get to apply. It's called the ECL, a what the heck, the expected credit loss model. Um, and really the change here is that your old measurement of impairment was based on history. This is supposed to now use probabilities going forward of potential future defaults. So now we get to look at uh, how a receivable might react in the future, not necessarily based on history or as use history as well as future for, uh, forward-looking information. And you got three buckets for it. Lifetime ECL, lifetime credit impaired, and 12-month ECLs. Uh, sounds a little bit complicated. It is. You kind of got to follow the handbook now as you're going through and, and measuring it. Um, but for trade receivables, there's really some good news out here. Trade receivables, you just record uh, the lifetime ECL at the inception of the receivable, which is really saying, okay, I've got a $100 receivable. I think mm, maybe 3% might default. I'm going to record uh, $97 as my receivable and accrete the remaining $3 over the term of that receivable. I told you some of this is going to get technical. There's my ECLs, and I'm a little behind here. Sorry about that. Uh, for trade receivables, you can use that simplified approach. Perfect. As for financial liabilities, hey, not a lot of changes. Still have fair value through profit or loss, and you still have other liabilities. Those are your choices. Hedging, not really going to talk about hedging other than it's simpler to apply under the new standard. Disclosure, joy, more, lots more. Uh, there's analysis, uh, gains and losses on derecognition would be an example. 
information on credit risk, how is the company managing its credit risk and making its decisions, these are now going to make their way into, the, into your financial statements. So uh, also reconciliations, um, loss allowances by class. So there's a fair amount of disclosure that every company is going to have coming forward from IFRS 9. Uh, transition. Well, transition should be applied retrospectively. There's no requirement to restate, but, and it's a big but, you must reconcile your opening retained earnings and OCI. So you can look backwards and forwards. You don't have to restate your prior year, but you have to have a reconciliation note in detail breaking out how you have made your decisions. Again, as the night progresses, this is um, getting dusky. You'll notice a body by the car. Uh, that is a real person down there, one of the friends of the family. We have my daughters slightly to the right. The uh, nice hooded girl on the left would be my wife. And uh, in start the kids. And I'm going to switch over to a different IFRS now. IFRS 15, and 15 is the revenue side. And IFR, whoop. Not bad, eh? Very good. <laughs> I'll probably do that again. So this is revenue from, uh, revenue from contracts with customers. Uh, it is, oh, here we go. It is, okay, is that working? not yet, okay. I thought it was so good for a second, but no. Okay, let's see, let's try it, let's see, oh. there we go, takes two, thank you Grant. So it's for effective for years, commence, I better keep this off of there. Effective for years uh, commencing on or after January 1, 2018. So this is coming at you if you have revenue. And the big deal here is that it, it really creates this, whoops, I'll keep up. It creates one comprehensive model to account for revenue from contracts. <laughs> keep calm and love IFRS 15. It replaces a slew of other IFRSs or pieces of guidance. I, IS 18 was the old revenue standard and it was nine pages long. This little fellow's over 50. So there's a lot in here. It started in 2002. It came out in 2014. So it's been around a while. They've been waiting for companies to look at it, to get ready to uh, implement it. Well, it's here. And the deal is here, the big change, you recognize revenue upon transfer of control, transfer of control of the keywords, whereas previously it was a risk reward model. It's principles based, I love that, except that there's a lot of prescriptive guidance. There's over 100 examples in this thing. And that is good and bad news to this audience. The good news is you have 100 examples. The bad news is you gotta find out which one is yours. And you've got to look through that, and you've got to find it. It's a new way of thinking. You've got to document how the standards are met. So you've got to go through the revenue contracts, and you have actually have to document how they each apply to IFRS 15. It's a documentation requirement. We have to audit it. Uh, your boards should have it so that you're showing them what kind of uh, work you've done in the background to make sure you're compliant. It, it's not a small undertaking. And the biggest impact is going to be on telecommunications, software, real estate. Huge increase in disclosure. I think there's four additional pages in the handbook just related to disclosure. Thanks very much. It's a five-step model to achieve some, the core of the principle. You identify a contract, fair game. Performance obligations, that's what the company has to do. Determine a price, 
allocate that price over the timeline that you're doing your work and make sure it's satisfied. And I'll go through each one very, I guess I'll say quickly. Um, first one is to identify the contract with that customer. Enforceable rights could be written and it could be oral. That's kind of, a, I think, a, a new one. It can be oral and it can be based on regular customer practices. You can identify payment terms. There's a probability of collection. In effect, this thing is a um, really a bona fide um, transaction that has, has commercial substance. Identifying, this is the second part, identify the performance obligations. And your performance obligations is what you have to do. Your promises of providing services or goods. And here comes a what the heck. If distinct, then accounted for separately. If it's not distinct, then you combine. So what does that mean? Well, distinct is the customer benefit exists on its own and it's separately identifiable from other parts of a contract. Um, and I'm gonna say, as I, I probably best by an example for distinct. If I've got software and I'm selling software and I have software installation, those can be two separate and distinct pieces of revenue. If the software I can sell to somebody and I can install it later on for a fee or someone else can install it for a fee so the prices are known and other people can do it. If however I sell, so that would be two separate components, two distinct sales. If however that software that I sold has to be installed on a customized basis and I'm the only person who can do it, then chances are that software is not yet usable to a customer until I install it and I have one distinct revenue. So you keep moving yourself up until you become distinct and can recognize revenue. Determine the transaction price. That's what you expect you're going to be entitled to receive. It could be fixed. It could be variable. If it's variable, you got some more what the heck coming at you. There's some defined terms, expected amount and most likely amount, and I'm gonna leave you to go to the handbook to look what those really mean. You allocate the transaction price. An allocation is generally just done on proportion of the sale, standalone prices of the good or service within the contract. And again, a couple of special ways to do it. There's three of them, adjusted market, expected cost plus and residual approach. So for your revenue, you got, you know, if you're a company with revenue, you've got to go through this standard and you've got to walk through all of these items and make your choices and document your choices because they're going to be subject to audit to make sure that you're in compliance with IFRS 15 when you're recognizing revenue. So it is a big hairy deal. It is a big piece of analysis. And recognize, of course, when this is satisfied. And that is when it's transferred or when the customer obtains control. And there are some definitions for what control means yet again. And so you're going to have to go to the handbook and say, OK, transfer of control occurred when. And you measuring that progress over time, you use one method of either the output or the input method. And again, you've got definitions within the handbook, and you've got to hit those criteria. So recognition is getting a little more complex. Um, you really do need to look at which one fits you. And lastly, disclosure requirements, disaggregation of revenue. Uh, there's quite a list for that one, lots of them. And you have a lot of significant judgments. And whenever you have significant judgments, I promise you, you have significant disclosure. Um, so judgment simply means more disclosure in this case. Transition approaches. Full retrospective. Doubt too many people are going to do that. Or retrospective, pardon me. And you've got the modified. 
uh, which so a full retrospective means you're going to restate all of your prior year numbers, including a, probably a third year balance sheet. Modified approach is really a catch up adjustment, again, with the reconciliation so your reader can see what the effect was in the past, but only affects your current year. Uh, the lights are uh, getting darker. This is our driveway. Uh, and at the back, I don't know if you can see that too well as a tent. We don't have kids go up the stairs anymore because the volume is just a little too high. Uh, you just push shoulders and keep moving through and we just hand out accordingly. So it, it, it's, it's a fair amount of fun. We catch people off guard. There's lots of screaming that comes out of our driveway. <laughs> Onward, IFRS 16, this is leases. Commencing 2019. This one has an effect on the lessee, and it's a big effect, and it's going to affect a lot of companies in the room. You capitalize all, and I mean, operating, uh, <coughs> there's a lot of operating leases out there. If they're longer than one year, or if they're considered material, they're not going to be considered operating leases anymore. They're going to be capitalized. This is going to impact your balance sheet. <clears throat> you're going to have a liability. You're going to have an asset. The asset is going to be called a right to use asset. It might be your office lease for five years. That's a right to use your office space with an offsetting lease liability. So brush off your net present value tables. Get out your finance books. Here we go. We're going to clutter up our balance sheets, income statements, and cash flow for this. Uh, I guess I'm a little cynical, and that must be uh, a statement from Guy Thomas, his judgment, not necessarily that of the firms. <laughs> uh, new estimates and judgments will be required. You can guess that for sure. And of course, uh, new disclosure requirements. Um, you're also going to have to differentiate between leases and service contracts, because service contracts you don't capitalize those. There are some exemptions. Uh, Non-regenerative assets. So you're not going to record the leases that you've entered into for your mineral properties or your oil and gas. That kind of stuff is exempted. And there's a whole bunch, there's a few others, biological service concessions and licenses. The impact, well, is most companies. If you're a company that has a lease for either of, let's say office space, retail, warehouse, vehicles, equipment, or other arrangements you're affected. You're going to have to at least analyze it and it might hit your balance sheet. You're going to need to substantiate your assessments in the context of the standard itself. You're going to have to go through and analyze each agreement to determine if you do have to capitalize your lease or not. And that will be subject again to audit. Sorry, it's the way we are, we're auditors. Just to finish, you got a high, um, you record this right of use asset with an offsetting lease liability. It's based on your net present value calculation. So you've got to consider options. Um, your assets are going to be subject to other standards, IAS 16, IAS 36. Um, liabilities are going to be accreted. Uh, this is going to affect your cash flow. DIT, you're going to have timing differences for tax. Um, you're going to have to have huge disclosure to reconcile your liabilities now to your uh, cash flow statement. That's going to be another requirement. As for transition, you can choose full or modified retrospective transition approach. If it's modified, you just look forward. At the day of booking this thing, what are my obligations going forward? What's the value of that? That's also the value of my asset. That's probably the simplest way to go through this one. You are going to, whoop, you are going to have to, sorry, you are, you are going to have to introduce processes and, and controls into your companies to be able to identify leases in the first place. Each time they're written up, you should probably go through and, and analyze them. 
Uh, this is uh, my lovely wife and the fella on, I guess, your right would be me uh, in better days. And I'm just briefly going to breeze over the narrow scope amendments just to say they exist. IFRS 17, insurance contracts, and really narrow. Income taxes, some clarification. Statement of cash flows is more reconciliation of uh, amortized items back into the cash flow. So there's opening and closing balance, amortization accretion, so it is more clear to the reader. Share-based payments, again, relatively quick. Investment property. Uh, the one I do want to mention here is dis there's a disclosure initiative underway, and that is on materiality. And the intent here is to get rid of the overlapping or old information in your financial statements that really does not have any big impact on the reader. So uh, start, you know, take your pen to your statements and get rid of the old stuff that just doesn't matter anymore. Now it's going to be part of IFRS guidance. Recap, IFRS 9 affects all companies, at least for disclosure, IFRS 9 being the financial instruments. Two categories, classifications based on business model, you've got a new impairment model, and disclosure coming at you. As for IFRS 15 revenues, big effect on software, telecom, real estate, new criteria for revenue recognition, lots of new disclosure. IFRS 16 affects almost all companies, at least for an analysis perspective, uh, and there's really one type of lease going forward, and that's going to be a capital lease, and it's going to have exceptions, and that's when they're immaterial or less than a year. The final takeaways, well, what I've just talked about really should be uh, noted in your year-end financial statements because you're spo for those December 31 filers because you're supposed to disclose the effect that the new standards have on your statements. And now that what the heck moment, don't wait. Q1 is going to be at you in a hurry. You will not have time to do this, to do this assessment if you start at the tail end of Q1. Start today get going. If there's anything we can help you with, please let us know. Thank you.